Hello friends, Namaskar, this is Sanjay. Welcome to part 12 of this video series and the title of this video is Distinction between Assessment for Learning and Assessment of Learning School-Based Assessment, Continuous and Comprehensive Evaluation, Perspective and Practice This happens to be the 12th topic in the CTET CDP syllabus and like all other videos you will find English and Hindi versions of this video on our channel This is a longer video and some of the topics that I will discuss in this video might be a little confusing. So you might not be able to understand or grasp everything the first time that you watch this video. If you don't understand, be patient and watch the entire video till the end. You can always rewind it and start this video again from the beginning and the second time you watch this, you will have a better understanding of all the topics that are covered. We'll start this video by taking a look at assessment and evaluation. What are the differences between these two terms? We look at various types of assessment such as assessment for learning, assessment as learning and assessment of learning. We will look at what is continuous and comprehensive evaluation. And we will also speak about school based assessment. And we will also look at uh, the tools and techniques of assessment. And we will end this session with uh, some sample questions from previous question papers. So let's get started. The first thing that we will try to understand is what is the connection between assessment and evaluation. Well, assessment is more holistic in nature. That is, this is a much bigger concept and it can include evaluation. Evaluation is just measurement. That is, you are measuring the learning of a child. Whereas, assessment includes the measurement of learning and also the corrective action that you are going to take on the basis of what you learn because of this measurement. For example, if your evaluation, that is your measurement, shows that there are some gaps in the learning or in the understanding of a child in your classroom, then you are going to look at the reasons behind that gaps. You are going to see whether the issue is with the child or the issue is with the teaching process and you are going to take some corrective action on the basis of the information that you got from measurement. Therefore, assessment includes measurement and the action that you are going to take on the basis of that measurement. Next, let us do a quick uh, comparison between assessment and evaluation on the basis of some of the important points. Let's see what are the key differences between these two. Now, assessment is formative in nature because through assessment you are trying to form the knowledge of the child. Right? Because assessment can be for learning as well. Right? Therefore, through assessment you are trying to form the knowledge of the child. Whereas in evaluation you are just trying to summarize. You are trying to look at what the child has learnt. Right? You are not trying to improve the child's knowledge here. And assessment can be diagnostic in nature because it can tell you the improvement areas of the child, the improvement areas of the teacher and the improvement areas in the teaching and learning process itself. Whereas evaluation is judgmental because at the end of an evaluation, for example, at the end of a weekly test or a monthly test or an annual exam, you will arrive at a score. Right? So you are trying to judge this student is good, this student is not good. Right? Therefore, you are trying to arrive at a score. Therefore, it is judgmental in nature. And assessment is qualitative because here you are not just looking at a score. You are not just looking at the what. You are also looking at the how or the why. Right? Therefore, assessment is qualitative. Whereas, evaluation is quantitative because end of the evaluation you will arrive at a specific number. You will arrive at a percentage or a rank. Therefore, evaluation is quantitative. Now, assessment is process oriented. That is, you are trying to make sure that the child understands the basics properly. So, if the child is doing division, you are interested in making sure that the child is following the correct process of division. If the child makes some small error, some small multiplication error or, or a small calculation error, right? that's why he could not come to the correct answer. That is okay because you are looking at the process. Does the child understand the basics of what division is all about? Whereas in evaluation, you are looking at the outcome. You are not interested in what process the child has used. You are just looking at whether the child has arrived at the correct answer, yes or no. And assessment can be ongoing. That is, assessment is part of the teaching and learning process and it goes on throughout the year. Whereas evaluation is periodic. Think about weekly tests or monthly tests or annual tests. So it is periodic in nature. Assessment provides feedback. Like I mentioned earlier, because assessment is diagnostic in nature and it provides improvement areas or tells you about the improvement opportunities, 
it provides feedback whereas evaluation just shows the completion and the shortfalls that is whether these chapters have been completed yes no whether the child has knowledge enough to solve problems in that chapter yes no so it is showing just the completion and it is showing the shortfalls right it is not providing that much of a feedback then assessment tests how the learning is going on because it is part of the teaching and learning process on an ongoing basis right so it is included in the teaching and learning process whereas evaluation tells you what has been learned so this is most mostly post mortem right this is telling you at the end of the year what the child has learned yes no that's it and assessment happens during the learning process as i said it is trying to see how the teaching and learning is going on whereas evaluation happens at the end of the learning process that is the weekly test or the monthly test or the annual test right so at the end of a particular period and in assessments students can learn from each other right whereas in evaluation students are competing with each other because in an evaluation like a monthly test or an annual test all the students are competing for a rank or a percentage right therefore there is competition the students are not learning from each other and in assessment it is absolute comparison that is you are looking at the student as an individual you are not comparing the student to anybody else whereas in evaluation you are comparing the student to other students in the same class that's what uh, the ranking process is all about right therefore these are the key differences between assessment and evaluation you can pause the video here and read all the points once more and if you want you can rewind this and listen to all the explanation once more so that you understand the basic differences between assessment and evaluation to understand assessment and evaluation much better let's look at some examples right assessment can be done through class discussions as well where you give a topic and the students are discussing something within the class so you can see whether the children have the knowledge of that particular topic how they interact with each other how they cooperate with each other how they control their emotions so you can assess a lot of things through these discussions in the classroom right and assessment can also be done by calling students to explain something on the board this again tells you whether students have the knowledge on the topic what is their confidence level whether they are able to explain their point of view so you can assess a lot of things through this process of calling them to explain something on the board as well or assessment can be done through a presentation or a project how well they present the information how well they explain the concepts right and through projects you can also see how well they cooperate with each other assessment can be done through peer assessment that is you can ask the children to assess each other so you will get to know what other children feel about a particular child or what kind of interaction they have right so peer assessment is also a part of the assessment process and hands on experiments it is whether the children have just memorized something or do they really know how to do it so you can judge that or test that through hands on experiments now let's look at evaluation evaluation is very simple right you are looking at things like weekly test monthly test quarterly test mid term exam final exam so what was the traditional way of testing students right through all these various tests at different uh, intervals so this is evaluation whereas the current process is assessment which happens throughout the year through not just tests but all these other activities such as discussions or explanations projects experiments so these are the examples of assessment and evaluation next let us look at the various types of assessment now if you look at uh, all these different types that are uh, listed on this page you can see that the types are decided on the basis of the reason for which you are doing the assessment for example you can do diagnostic assessments which are done at the beginning of the teaching learning process because you want to know what the students have already learned and what are their strengths and weaknesses for example before you start the classes for grade 4 you want to understand whether students have learned whatever was taught in grade 3 right and if required you can do some refreshers or you can do some orientation sessions therefore diagnostic is done at the beginning of the teaching and learning process because you want to understand what the students already know or assessment can be formative in nature as well because if you are conducting these assessments during the teaching learning process you are using these assessments also as a means to form the knowledge of the learners or the students for example 
by conducting activities like uh, projects or uh, by group discussions or by calling students to explain something on the board one you are trying to understand whether the students have understood the lesson right and you are also trying to get the students involved in the teaching learning process so that is formative it can also be summative like i said even evaluation even the tests that are conducted can also be part of the assessment process and if you are conducting these tests at the end of a specific time period it can be a weekly test or a monthly test or a mid term or a annual exam right you are summarizing the learning of the students so here students get to know what they have learned or what they have not learned so they are going to get some rank or percentage or grade and teachers can get some feedback because teachers can use the feedback that they have got from the performance of the students and improve the teaching and learning process for the next batch or the next year but students usually get just a rank or a score from these summative assessments and they don't get any useful feedback next assessment can be norm referenced as well that is if you are comparing the students against other students for example if uh, you are looking at an entrance exam then you want to give a chance for the top 100 students or the top 300 students to get into a particular institution or to get into a particular course so you are comparing the students against a norm or you are comparing the students against other students and that is norm referenced then there is criterion referenced criterion referenced can be like ctet where you are comparing students against a specific standard you are not bothered about how many students pass that particular standard or how many students meet that particular standard for example in ctet you are saying that there is a specific pass mark 60% is the pass mark right? so now it might be that only 10% of the students meet that standard or it might be that 80% of the students meet that standard but if the standard is set at 60% that is the criteria or the criterion against which you are comparing all the students so that is criterion referenced and then there can be interim assessment that is if you are doing the assessment in the middle of the teaching learning process at various intervals right to understand the progress of the teaching or the learning process right? so that is interim assessment therefore if you look at these different types of assessment they are all based on for what purpose you are doing the assessment so pause this video here and read all these points once or twice if required rewind and listen to the explanation once more so that you understand all these different types of assessment because you will see questions based on these different types of assessments next let us understand the concepts of assessment for learning assessment as learning and assessment of learning now these are three very important concepts on which you will see questions very frequently in the exam now assessment for learning is where the teachers and the students participate in the assessment process right and the examples for assessment for learning can be group discussions or where the teacher is calling students to explain something on the board or students are participating in a group activity such as a project so in assessment for learning the students get a feedback on their own strengths and weaknesses and the teacher also gets a feedback on how well the teaching process is going on and if it needs any modification and the students can use this assessment activity to improve their knowledge for example if you call students to participate in a group discussion and during the group discussion the teacher can understand how well the students have understood the basics or the concepts that are being discussed how well they interact with each other how they can frame their answers how they can discuss with each other how convincing they are right so the teacher is getting feedback about the students the students are getting feedback about themselves during these discussions during these interactions the students are learning from each other therefore their knowledge is also forming so this is formative therefore assessment for learning happens during the teaching and learning process and it can be used for forming the knowledge of the students so assessment for is formative and next assessment as learning so assessment as learning can be like uh, the quiz or the puzzles that you will get at the end of a chapter right because here the teacher is not trying to see how well you have solved the quiz or the puzzle right the students are solving it by themselves then they can look at the answer they can assess themselves and through this students get to know how well they have understood the particular concept and it reinforces their understanding and 
assessment as learning can also be peer assessment for example at the end of a particular activity you can ask students to assess the person sitting right next to them so it also gives you an understanding of how students assess each other how do they view each other therefore assessment as learning is also part of the teaching learning process but here the students assess themselves whereas in assessment for learning the teachers and students both participate in the process and the teacher is assessing the students first and the students can also assess themselves on the basis of the performance in their activities right and next comes assessment of learning so assessment of learning is nothing but evaluation because if you are conducting an assessment at the end of the teaching and learning process and you are trying to summarize the learning of the students using standardized tests like a weekly test or a monthly test or an annual exam right so here you are trying to assess what has happened during that entire time period and students get a specific grade or marks and they can be given some ranks as well and summative assessment can be shared with a wider community for example students get a particular percentage or a particular mark that can be used for admissions and for various purposes therefore assessment of learning happens at the end of the teaching learning process and it is for summarizing the learning of the students now let me just repeat what i have explained so far assessment for learning happens during the teaching learning process and both the students and teachers participate in this process and both of them get feedback assessment as learning only the students are mainly participating this and they are assessing themselves or assessment as learning can also happen through peer assessment right so here the teacher is not assessing it's the students themselves or their peers who are assessing them and assessment of learning uses standardized tests and this happens at the end of the teaching learning process so this is to summarize the learning that is happened during that entire period and these are usually the exams that happen after a particular period so this is assessment for as and of learning the next concept that we will talk about is continuous and comprehensive evaluation so what is this cce all about well let's uh, look at some examples which will help us understand this concept of cce better ram and sham were two friends so both of them put effort in their studies throughout the year but just before the exam sham got fever so he could not sit in the final exam so what happened he failed whereas ram sat in the final exam and he passed now if we depend only on the annual exam then sham has failed and ram has passed but if we look at the effort that both of them have put in throughout the year and if the assessment was done throughout the year right, then both of them would have passed so this is where continuous and comprehensive evaluation throughout the year would have helped next let's look at sita and geeta now sita was a student who not only studied but she also participated in sports and extracurricular activities whereas geeta focused only on studies now if we look at what will be their performance only at the final exam then maybe geeta gets better marks and sita will get lesser marks but here we are looking at only the academic performance right so if we were to use continuous and comprehensive evaluation then we will give weightage to not only the academic concepts but the sports and the extracurricular act as well so then sita also would have got high marks and geeta who has focused only on studies she also would have got high marks so both of them would have been rated equally if we had used continuous and comprehensive evaluation rather than just focusing on the academic evaluation and let's look at uh, ramesh and suresh right so what ramesh did was uh, he studied throughout the year he tried to understand the complete subject and because he was trying to cover a vast subject he could not do it in a very thorough manner right and he got b grade in the final exam but he had put in the effort to try and understand the entire subject whereas what suresh did was he partied throughout the year but just before the exam he solved some previous question papers and he studied some guide books and because many of the questions got repeated he did well and he got a in the final exam but if you actually look at it ramesh has actually understood the subject better whereas 
Suresh just managed to do well in that one final exam, even if he has not understood the subject so well. Right? So here, if we had used continuous and comprehensive evaluation, then we would have evaluated both of them throughout the year. And we would have seen that Ramesh is actually a better student. So Ramesh probably would have gotten A and Suresh would have gotten a B. But if we use only a summative assessment at the end of the year, then Suresh would get an A and Ramesh would get a B. So these are the advantages of continuous and comprehensive evaluation where we can evaluate the students throughout the year. We can evaluate them not only on the basis of academics, but we can evaluate them on the basis of their participation or performance in sports and extracurriculars as well. And we are not only just using the summative assessment to see how well they have done in a specific exam, but we are assessing them throughout the year so that we can understand how well they have grasped the subject as a whole. So these are the advantages of continuous and comprehensive evaluation. So based on the examples that we just saw, you must have understood that continuous evaluation means that the evaluation is happening on a continuous basis throughout the year right? and not just on the basis of some annual exam or monthly exam or final exam. Right? So evaluation is happening on a continuous basis and you must have also understood that evaluation is happening on a comprehensive basis. That is, we are not just focusing on the scholastic or the curriculum or the academics. We are also looking at the co-scholastic or the extracurricular activities as well. So this is comprehensive. And looking at the history of uh, continuous and comprehensive evaluation, it was first suggested in the National Policy of Education in 1986. Right? And it was also suggested in the National Curriculum Framework of 2005. However, it was given a legal status or it was authorized by the Right to Education Act in 2009 under Article 29.1. And it was launched as a pilot for CBSE Class 9 in the academic year 2009. And uh, it was rolled out on a national level from the 1st of April of 2010. And currently, if you look at the NEP 2020, the continuous and comprehensive evaluation process is being further streamlined and there are some reforms that are coming in. And these changes will continue over the next few years. So this is the history of continuous and comprehensive evaluation. It is continuous because it happens throughout the year and it is comprehensive because you are not just looking at the curricular activities, but you are also looking at the extracurricular activities. So, what are the advantages of continuous and comprehensive evaluation? Well, first of all, it reduces exam related stress and anxiety because students are not just going to be worried about how their performance will be in the monthly exam or the annual exam. They know that they are being assessed on a regular basis. So, even if a student does not do well in the final exam, that is not the end of the world because the student has been assessed throughout the year. So, that exam stress and the exam fever that we see, that will definitely be reduced through continuous and comprehensive evaluation throughout the year. Right? And it also reduces the dropout rate because if students are failing in the monthly exam or the annual exam, right, and uh, then eventually they tend to drop out of school. But here, because of the continuous and comprehensive evaluation, because there is assessment happening throughout the year and the teacher also can do some additional activities or can take some corrective action wherever required. So we are not waiting till the end of the year to understand how well that student has learned something. Therefore, this continuous and comprehensive evaluation can help in reducing the dropout rate by making this entire learning process more enjoyable right? and not just stressing out students and focusing them only on the exams. And again, here continuous and comprehensive evaluation means that there is a greater focus on learning throughout the year rather than just performance in the exams. Right? Remember the example that I told you about uh, Ramesh and Suresh and uh, Ramesh studies throughout the year but uh, Suresh just focuses on the exam just before the exam and he studies and guidebooks or he looks at some uh, important questions from previous question papers and he gets higher marks. So that was unfair. So through continuous and comprehensive evaluation we are going to focus on learning throughout the year rather than just on performance in the exams. And through continuous and comprehensive evaluation, we focus on the holistic development of learners. That is, we are not just looking at their academic performance, we are also giving importance to the co-scholastic or the extracurricular activities. And 
because if you look at all of these then this CCE will definitely promote a learner friendly environment because anything that makes the learning more enjoyable is learner friendly and these co-curricular activities and extracurricular activities will also help students equip themselves with life skills because if you are participating in some sports then you learn the importance of teamwork, you learn the importance of cooperation, you learn the importance of negotiation. So you, all these are life skills that you will learn through these co-curricular and extracurricular activities. So these activities give students an opportunity to learn beyond what is being taught in the curriculum. Therefore, since continuous and comprehensive evaluation encourages co-curricular and extracurricular activities, this is ideal for making better human beings. Therefore, these are some of the advantages of continuous and comprehensive evaluation. The image or the graphic on this page summarizes whatever we have discussed so far about continuous and comprehensive evaluation. So in CCE, you have the continuous part and the comprehensive part. In continuous part, if you look at it, there is learning which is happening and the assessments are also happening in parallel with the learning that is the assessments are integrated into the teaching learning process when we look at uh, formative assessment then there can be assessment as learning and assessment for learning as well so assessment for learning is where we are focusing on the quality aspect that is what is the quality of the learning that has happened and we also use summative assessment now summative assessment are the monthly tests or the annual tests and here we are doing assessment of learning where we are focusing on the quantity of the learning right? and on the comprehensive side if you look at it we are giving attention to the scholastic and the co-scholastic aspects of learning as well that is we are looking at the academics and the co-curriculars or the extracurriculars as well to assess what is happening on the scholastic side we can use formative assessments and summative assessments and on the co-scholastic side, we are giving weightage to other aspects such as life skills, work education or visual and performing arts or attitudes and values, all of which will be very, very important in the future for the children. Therefore, this is what continuous and comprehensive evaluation is all about. If you want to learn more about uh, continuous and comprehensive evaluation, then you should refer to NCRT's uh, CCE guidelines booklet which actually talks about how CCE can be implemented in a real classroom. The next concept that we are going to talk about is school-based assessment. Now, what is the school-based assessment? Now, to understand this, let's look at uh, what happens in a typical uh, final exam, right? The question paper is set by somebody else. It is printed and sent to all the schools. The students take the exam. Then the answer sheets are also evaluated by some external examiners. So here we are talking about assessment by external exams. So the basic concept of this school based assessment is that the entire assessment is happening at a school level instead of through external exams because the teachers and the school who have seen the student throughout the year, they are in a better position to assess the students and they can do it in a more holistic way rather than these external exams. So this uh, concept of uh, school-based assessment was first proposed in Hong Kong in the year 2000 and uh, it was rolled out in India in the form of the continuous and comprehensive evaluation through the RTE Act 2009. So in short, this school-based assessment is nothing but the continuous and comprehensive evaluation that we are talking about so far. So what does the NEP 2020 say about uh, school-based assessment? Well, NEP 2020 essentially talks about 360 degree assessment through this school based assessment process. That is, the assessment needs to be multi layered and multiple sources. That is, you are using different types of uh, assessment methods and you are getting information from various sources to achieve this 360 degree assessment. That is, assessment can be self assessment by teachers, by peers, and by parents as well. And we are talking about assessment of various parameters such as cognitive abilities of the child, the psychomotor abilities of the child and we are also looking at affective assessment. So what is this affective assessment? Well, Affective assessment means how the learning or how the education is affecting the students attitudes, interests and values because 
the end result of the education must be positive right if it is not affecting the students attitudes interests or values in a positive way then the education might not be of much use so 360 degree assessment is what the nep 2020 advocates and it says that uh, we can track the progress of the inquiry based learning through modes like a quiz role play group work portfolios etc which are integrated into the teaching and learning process and it also talks about uh, implementing uh, artificial intelligence based software to track the development of the child throughout the school years on this page you will see a list of uh, items which are the advantages of school based assessment now these are important because uh, you will often see question asking you to identify which of the following is an advantage of school based assessment so let us quickly go through this list now school based assessment because it is part of the teaching learning process it is integrated into the teaching learning process so assessment is not separate it is integrated in the day to day learning that happens in the classroom and school based assessment is child centered and it is activity based because you are not just using a standardized test to assess the students or evaluate the students you are using the day to day activities of the children that happens in the classroom like classroom discussions or presentations or projects to assess and evaluate the children so it is child centered and activity based and there is a focus on competency development rather than content memorization if it was just about passing an exam then they would just have to memorize something and write it in the exam and they would pass but here the focus is on making sure that the competencies are developed their basics are developed and they understand the concepts and not just remember it and assessment becomes more meaningful by including self and peer assessment that is in a traditional assessment where you are using an exam a standardized test the assessment is being done only by the teacher but in school based assessment there is self assessment and there is also peer assessment along with the teacher assessment and as we discussed previously it is non threatening stress free and it enhances the participation and interaction of the students because here students don't have the tension that i have to prepare for a final exam because the assessment is happening throughout the year and they are participating in the assessment process on an ongoing basis and here the assessment is focused on for learning and as learning right? because you are trying to improve the knowledge of the children through this assessment as well and you are not just trying to test it right? you are not just trying to test what they have learned or what they have understood right? so school based assessment is focused on for learning and as learning and not off learning next because there is a less tension in the students and they are more involved in the assessment process there is uh, more faith and uh, there is more interaction on the teacher and on the school system that they will not unnecessarily fail me right and uh, school based assessment gives better results students are assessed in a better way therefore it enhances the self confidence of the children and uh, of course school based assessment will also reduce the load on the teachers because uh, in case of a final exam you have to print the papers you have to send it out you have to collect the answer scripts you have to uh, evaluate it so everything is happening in one shot whereas school based assessment is spread throughout the year therefore it reduces the load on the teachers so these are the advantages of school based assessment let us move on to the tools and techniques of assessment we will look at some of the most important tools and techniques that are going to be important from your exam point of view these include assessment tests observation checklist rating scale questionnaire interview portfolio project cumulative record anecdotal record and case study so you will frequently see questions related to all these different types of tools and techniques of assessment so let's start going through them one by one the first tool or uh, technique of assessment that we will talk about are achievement tests so what are achievement tests achievement tests are uh, usually summative in nature right so these are tests which are uh, used to understand what the children have learned in a specific period of time or from specific parts of the syllabus or specific chapters or specific uh, topics so these are achievement tests now these achievement tests can be objective type test essay oral type written type performance test so they can be any type of test now these achievement tests can be broadly classified into two types they can be teacher made tests where the teacher is actually conducting the test 
at the end of every week or at the end of a particular chapter or ad hoc that is uh, at the middle of a chapter to understand what children have learnt during that period of time or from those particular chapters or topics so if the teacher is deciding the standard the pattern the scope the syllabus and everything of a particular test then these are called teacher made tests and the feedback from these teacher made tests are going both to the teacher and the student and it helps them understand what they have learnt from a specific chapter the teacher gets to know whether the teaching learning process is ideal for this group of students and the students get to know what are the gaps in their understanding of that particular topic right so teacher made tests everything is being decided by the teacher and then there are unit tests so unit tests are more standardized for example you may have uh, some specific tests at the end of every chapter or you might have the weekly exams or you might have the monthly exams or you might have midterms or you might have the annual exam so these are all unit tests because they are designed to assess the learning of a particular unit so in a standardized test that is in a standardized unit test the format of the exam the syllabus and the time of the question paper how it will be uh, corrected what will be the negative marking all that is standardized it is not decided by the teacher it will be the same standard that will be followed by all teachers so those are standardized and these unit tests can be con- conducted at the end of uh, each unit of the syllabus they can be conducted at the end of a chapter or they can be conducted uh, after a particular period of time that is uh, at the half yearly point or at the year end and uh, both of these that is teacher made tests and unit tests are useful in understanding the competency of the learners in a specific unit so these are achievement tests very very simple the next uh, technique of assessment that we will talk about is observation now there are uh, several aspects to the development of a child there are uh, quantifiable aspects and there are qualitative aspects quantifiable aspects such as what is the child's performance in a particular chapter those can be measured through the standardized tests and there is a marks card in which the results can be tabulated but uh, what about all the qualitative aspects how do we measure the confidence level of the child how do we measure the creativity of the child so all such qualitative aspects can be understood through observation now the child is spending a large part of the day in the classroom therefore the teacher can observe the students and when the teacher is uh, meeting the parents during the parent teacher meeting then the teacher can give a lot of qualitative feedback for example your child is very good at speaking the child is very confident right the child interacts very well with uh, people in the classroom and outside the classroom as well right but uh, the child's uh, handwriting is very bad so we'll have to work on improving the handwriting the child is uh, very interested in extracurricular activities like singing dancing drama but the child is not participating in any sports activities therefore we will have to focus on some sports activities as well and uh, the child is uh, taking a lot of time into complete activities in the classroom therefore we will have to work on the punctuality and the effective use of time so all such qualitative feedback is given on the basis of observation so the students progress and uh, behavior in several areas which cannot be evaluated using paper pencil tests so all such qualitative aspects can be understood through observation another uh, very important tool of uh, assessment is a checklist a checklist is uh, a very simple method through which uh, we can understand whether the child is able to follow a specific uh, set of steps or the child is uh, performing all the activities that uh, are supposed to be performed for example if we are trying to assess uh, the child's uh, computer skills then in the computer lab we can uh, use a checklist to assess whether the child is able to turn on the computer whether the child is able to log into the correct account whether the child is able to open software like uh, ms paint whether the child is able to create a simple drawing and we see that the child is not able to save the documents properly and the child forgets to switch off the computer and the child is not handling the equipment uh, in the proper way the child is mishandling the mouse or the keyboard so that is also something which we can understand so using this checklist we can understand what are the computer skills of the child so the child is able to log in and child is able to open the correct software but there are some gaps that we need to address so these are the aspects that we need to work on
Therefore, a checklist is a very simple tool that can be used to assess the performance of the child in a specific activity or a specific task. The next uh, tool of assessment that we will talk about is a rating scale. Now a rating scale is very similar to a checklist. As you can see here, it also has a list of items or attributes. But uh, instead of just saying yes or no, present or absent, here we can give a specific rating for each of these parameters. For example, if we are trying to understand about the child's participation in school projects. If we say yes, we don't know up to what level. If we say no, then we know that the child is not participating. So if we are saying yes, then we can give a rating for that. In the sense, if the child is moderately participating, then we can say at a level 3. How well is the child working with his peers? The child has a very good social skills, so we can mark it at 5. And leadership qualities. The child has a very average or below average leadership qualities, so we can mark it as 1 or 2. And uh, then we can say how well the child is participating in group discussions. The child uh, is not so confident and the child is not participating well in group discussions. Therefore, we can mark it again as 1 or 2. And uh, participation in sports. Yes, the child is uh, very, very interested in sports. So instead of just saying yes, we can say the child is very interested in sports. So that will be a level 5. So that way, each of these parameters can be rated. So a checklist in which we are using a rating is a rating scale. Next, we will talk about uh, a questionnaire. A questionnaire is something that you are already very familiar with because uh, you would have answered questionnaires or surveys in the past. So a questionnaire can have uh, a set of uh, standardized questions so that all participants are answering the same questions so that their uh, answers can be collated, tabulated, analyzed. So a questionnaire, when it has a set of questions, the answer can be either a simple yes or no, or it can be a set of uh, selection tick boxes that they have to select, or it might ask for more information where people have to type and provide some qualitative information. So a questionnaire is nothing but a set of questions. Another very useful uh, technique or tool of assessment is interview. So now an interview is nothing but a face to face interaction. So instead of using a questionnaire and giving a standardized set of questions, you can have an interview where you can use a wide variety of open ended or close ended questions. And uh, here the interviewer can ask for more elaboration, more explanation and can go in depth in specific areas of interest. And uh, these interviews are uh, specifically useful if you are dealing with very young children or with the people who are not literate because they might not be able to answer a questionnaire very well. So here an interview is very very useful. So interview is nothing but a face to face interaction with the person whom you are trying to assess. A portfolio is very very important from your exam point of view as well because almost every year you will see at least one question asking about what is a portfolio or asking about various aspects of a portfolio. Now a portfolio is a very very simple concept. It is just like a big scrapbook. It can be in the form of a book or it can just be a folder in which samples of the student's work from throughout the year are collected. For example, this is a portfolio which is in the form of books. Now in each page, there is one particular activity of the child that has been captured. There are some marks cards which are captured. There are some fun activities that the child has done. There are some extracurricular activities that the child has done. There are some photographs. So activities of the child throughout the year have been sampled in this portfolio. So tomorrow when somebody looks at this portfolio, they can easily understand what the child has been doing in school throughout the year and what are the areas that the child is interested in and uh, doing well and what are the areas where the child is not doing well. For example, if there are lots of extracurricular activities, right? whereas, whereas uh, the marks of the child that are shown in the marks cards are not up to the mark. So which means that the child is not doing so well academically, but the child is doing exceptionally well in extracurricular activities. So a portfolio gives a complete picture of the, what the child has been doing in school throughout the year. Projects or uh, project works are also very very useful in assessing children because uh, projects can be used for assessing both uh, scholastic or academic performance because if the projects are connected with uh, some subject or some specific part of the syllabus then they are measuring or assessing the scholastic aspects. 
if the projects are extracurricular in nature then they can measure the co scholastic or the extracurricular activities and uh, if children are uh, participating in these tasks or in these projects individually then you are assessing them individually whereas if uh, they are working on these projects as a team then you can also assess other aspects such as their team work and their uh, social interactions and uh, the knowledge and the skills that they have learned in the classroom for example if it is a maths related uh, project then the concepts of maths that they have learned in the classroom they can use in the projects so that way you can see whether children are able to apply the theory that they have learned in the classroom in completing a real world tasks therefore projects are very very useful as a tool or a technique of assessment next let us talk about uh, anecdotal records to understand what is an anecdotal record we should first know what is an anecdote an anecdote is a short story about a real incident or a person an anecdote is also called kissa in hindi now we already discussed about observation right where uh, the teacher is observing the children in the classroom and the ch- teacher is able to get information about uh, the children's participation in academic and non academic activities and the teacher can capture this observation in some book saying that yes uh, the student is uh, doing well in academics the student is uh, doing well in uh, drama and other co curricular activities so the observation can lead to some brief inputs or information about the child and we also spoke about a portfolio a portfolio is a book or a file in which uh, the activities of the children are captured from throughout the year that is they can be in the form of marks cards which show the academic performance they can be in the form of some projects that the children have done or they can be in the form of uh, photographs of some of the activities that they have participated so a portfolio captures the child's activities throughout the year now suppose the teacher uses this observation and writes some short stories which illustrate or which show the incidents or the activities that the child has participated in and those incidents or stories are written in a book such as the portfolio then it becomes anecdotal record for example the teacher might observe that the child is interested in co curricular activities like uh, drama or dance and rather than just mentioning child is interested in drama right what the teacher does is she writes a small story about uh, how the child has participated in a drama activity in the month of january and the child played the po- uh, the part of a king in that particular drama and the child was very confident in the way that uh, he or she acted so the teacher is writing a small story which gives us a lot more information than just telling us that the child is interested in drama right and if this story is written in a book such as a portfolio then when whoever reads the portfolio can not only see the photos of the drama activity but can also read the story and that gives a lot more information and this portfolio can now be called an anecdotal record therefore observation and a portfolio together can become an anecdotal record next let us talk about uh, cumulative record now cumulative record used to be very popular as a tool of assessment previously but uh, nowadays uh, it is rarely used to understand what is a cumulative record think about uh, the annual marks card so the annual marks card will tell you what has been the child's performance throughout the year what are the marks that the child has scored in different exams what is the rank that the child has achieved in each of these exams and what is the attendance that uh, the child has in the class uh, throughout the year so such quantifiable data is captured for the entire year in a annual marks card so a cumulative record is nothing but a document which captures a very similar data across multiple years so if the child has studied in the same school from grade 1 till grade 5 instead of looking at five different annual marks cards and uh, trying to see what has been the child's progress throughout this uh, five year period a cumulative record gives us one document which we can refer to look at all such quantifiable data such as marks attendance the rank or any other achievements of the child for this entire five year time period so in short a cumulative record is like a marks card for multiple years next let us talk about a case study now a case study is uh, conducted by a teacher or uh, somebody senior in the school and a case study can be about a specific child 
or it can be about a group of children. Now, why is a case study done? So, a case study is an in-depth investigation. For example, if uh, a particular child is uh, not doing well in the classroom or if a particular group of children are not doing so well in the classroom, right? then if an in-depth study is done about the background of these children, about uh, the environment that the children are living in outside the school and uh, what kind of uh, experiences the children have had in the past and are currently having. So, if a case study is an in-depth study of all such aspects of the child in the classroom and outside the classroom. So, through a case study, we can understand why these children are not doing so well in the classroom. And it can also be done if the children are doing exceptionally well. For example, if there is one group of children who are doing very well in the classroom, then a case study can be done to understand why these children are doing so well in the classroom in academics or it might be in sports. And the information that is gathered through this case study can be used so that we can try to improve the performance of other children as well. Therefore, a case study is an in-depth study of the various aspects of the child's life so that we can understand what are the reasons behind the current behavior and performance. Next, let us solve some uh, sample questions from previous question papers and these questions are based on the topics that we just covered in this video. In this question, we are being asked to identify which of the following statements is correct. The first one is formative assessment can be summative also. Now, there is a reason why we call some types of assessment as formative and some types of assessment as summative. They are not one and the same. They are different. So, this statement is incorrect. Next, summative assessment is not as comprehensive as formative assessment. This is a correct statement. The reason why it is correct is, if you look at the annual exam marks card of a child, you will just get the marks of the child in that particular exam. You will not get information on why the child has done well or why the child has not done well in specific subjects. You will just get the marks of the child or the rank of the child. So, summative assessment gives us less information than formative assessment. Therefore, summative assessment is not as comprehensive as formative assessment. Therefore, this statement is correct. Next, there is hardly any difference between formative assessment and summative assessment. This is absolutely incorrect because there is a lot of difference between formative and summative assessment. So, there is hardly any difference. This is incorrect. And since all of the above are not correct because there are two incorrect statements here. So, this is also not correct. Therefore, Summative assessment is not as comprehensive as formative assessment is the answer to this question because that is the correct statement. School based assessment that is SBA focuses on which of the following. Now we discussed that school based assessment is an assessment which is done at a school level rather than through external exams. And because uh, the school based assessment is being done by the teachers and it also includes peer evaluation and self evaluation. So, a school based assessment is more comprehensive in nature. So, a SBA or a school based assessment can help us in diagnosing the deficiencies in the learner. This is correct. And it helps us in taking the remedial measures that is to correct these deficiencies. What are the actions that we need to take? So, SBA helps us in taking the appropriate remedial measures. This is also correct. And because SBA is comprehensive, that is, it is not just focusing on only the academics, but it is also focusing on the skills and the overall development of the child. So, SBA helps us in continuously developing the skills and the competencies of the learner. Therefore, this is also correct. Therefore, the answer to this question is all of the above, since all of these three statements are correct. Assessment for learning takes into account the following except now, assessment for learning is part of the teaching learning process and it is used for making sure that the children actually understand what is being taught. It is not just for measuring the performance of the student in a particular test or a particular exam. Right? Therefore, assessment for learning takes into account the needs of the students. It also takes into account the learning styles of the different students in the classroom and it also takes into account or tries to understand the strengths of the students. And it does not give lot of importance to the mistakes of the students. Right? Through the mistakes of the students, we are trying to identify the needs of the students. 
we are trying to identify the strengths or the weaknesses of the students or we are trying to identify the learning styles of the students so while mistakes of the students are visible through assessment for learning it does not give too much importance to mistakes therefore it takes into account all of these except the mistakes of the student to make assessment a useful and interesting process one should be careful about which of the following so we have to identify which of these statements is correct and which will help us in making assessment useful and interesting now if we make comparisons between different student like it is done in a summative assessment like the annual exam marks card so this is not useful and not so interesting for the students they'll just get to know what is their marks and what is their rank in the class so this is not the best answer next labeling students as intelligent or average learners if we intellig- say call some students as intelligence then that boosts their confidence whereas the children who are labeled as average learners we are actually reducing their confidence levels through this labels therefore this is also not the best option and using technical language to give feedback so if we use very highly technical language or technical jargon to give feedback then that is also not useful because the children and their parents might not be able to understand what you are trying to say so the feedback has to be in simple language which everybody can understand therefore this also is not the best option that leaves us with one option that is to make the assessment useful and interesting we can use a variety of ways to collect information about the students both scholastic and co-scholastic activities so we are not just looking at the academic performance we are also looking at the co-scholastic or the extracurriculars therefore option 3 is the best way to make assessment useful and interesting for all the parties continuous and comprehensive evaluation emphasizes on which of the following now this is a little tricky question because we can see that there are more than one possible correct answers the first one redundancy of the board examination no continuous and comprehensive evaluation does not make the board examination completely redundant board examination has its own purposes and reasons therefore this is something which is an incorrect statement next continuous testing on a comprehensive scale to ensure learning so here we see that continuous testing on a comprehensive scale to ensure learning this is a correct statement next how learning can be observed recorded and improved upon yes this is also a correct statement because when we are trying to do continuous and comprehensive evaluation we are trying to understand how the learning that is happening in the classroom can be observed can be recorded and can be improved therefore this statement is also correct and fine tuning of the tests with the teaching this statement is also correct because by continuous and comprehensive evaluation the information that we get we can fine tune the tests that we are giving so that they can capture better information about the students and about the learning process therefore this statement is also correct now here we have to identify which of these three statements is the most appropriate for this question and that is option 2 that is continuous testing on a comprehensive scale to ensure learning so here we are doing continuous testing we are using a comprehensive scale and we are also trying to ensure that learning is actually happening in the classroom therefore this is the best answer among the given options and uh, with that we come to the end of this video if you have any questions or uh, feedback please put them in the comment section below and uh, please do give this uh, video a like and uh, subscribe to this channel and you can also share this video with your friends and i will see you again in uh, the next video in this series and we will cover one more topic in the cdp syllabus till then take care stay safe